Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is David Conover, vice president for research and innovation and professor of biology at the University of Oregon. He began his tenure at the U of O on August 15, 2016. Prior to coming to the UO, Conover was Vice President for Research at Stony Brook University, where he previously served as Dean of the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences and Professor of Marine Science. From 2010 to 2013, Conover served as the Director of the Division of Ocean Sciences at the National Science Foundation. His research interests involve the ecology and evolutionary biology of fishes and fisheries science. Thanks, David, for coming on the show. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so you've been here since August. I have. Yes. <laughs> the first yeah. question is, yeah. what attracted to you? What attracted you to the University of Oregon? What was it about this position that was appealing? That's a great question. Uh, you know, when the a headhunter first contacted me about this uh, opportunity, I didn't know much about the University of Oregon, but as I started to explore um, what this university involves, and the and I began to discover that it's in a, such a transformational period in its history. Um, that's really, being part of that transformation, number one, that's what most attracted me. Uh, and what's, what is it about that transformation? It's the fact that we recently became an independent university with our own board that enables us to determine our own destiny. There's a whole new set of leaders on this campus. Um, President Chill being the first and foremost, and, and he is part of the part of what attracted me here, but also new leadership across the entire university, most of which is coming from the outside. So it really is an opportunity to redefine and re-identify what this university uh, will become. And I did have a slight indication that the night campus might be on the horizon <laughs> as well. Uh, and that's also transformational experience for this university. There's nothing more exciting than being part of transformation. Um, since you brought up the Knight Campus, what's the Knight Campus? Why is that an important thing? Tell us about that. It's the Knight Campus for Accelerating Scientific Impact. Uh, this university uh, is extremely strong in the basic sciences, uh, in the arts and humanities, social sciences, the professional schools, really strong um, and recognized worldwide. Uh, but there's a gap in that compared with our peer institutions we don't have an engineering program. We don't have a medical school. Those are disciplines where a lot of the translation of knowledge discoveries into practical applications occurs. So the Knight Campus is going to fill that gap. It's going to bring people that come from maybe a biomedical background, people that come from an engineering background, who can work with our natural scientists in helping us uh, accelerate the impact that discoveries we make can have on the quality of life for people. So you've, you've started to uh, talk about the question of impact in particular with the Knight Campus, but just say a little bit about why research at universities is important. W what's good about that? Why is that a worthwhile thing to do? Uh, let me tell you a story that I think illustrates it, and this isn't specific to this university, but to university research nationwide. Mm -hmm. When I started the National Science Foundation in 2010, do you happen to remember what the big story of the summer of 2010 was? The big media explosion? It was, it you was. Tell me. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm not testing I'm, you. I don't want to tell you. It is, it was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Oh, right, right, of course. And I started the National Science Foundation as the director of ocean science in the middle of that episode. And I quickly became the lead NSF person on the federal response team that involved all the agencies. Now, what happened was, that um, scientists throughout the nation called up our program officers at NSF and asked if they could reprogram their research and instead focus their activity on the Gulf of Mexico. And we had a program called the Rapid, uh, Rapid Award Program that can actually give money to people like almost in a matter of a few days uh, to do that kind of work. So hundreds of scientists across the nation started changing what they were doing. And uh, we repositioned vessels, and so our scientists it was like a civilian army of people ready to be deployed to work on this problem. But what made it more interesting was that uh, the other federal agencies were mostly focused on estimating the damage response because there were going to be lawsuits. Uh, in the middle of the summer, the well was finally capped, and then the Obama administration 
wanted to uh, assure the nation that the oil was being assimilated and that the problem would be diminishing. So the Obamas visited the Gulf of Mexico. They went swimming. They ate at a seafood restaurant. And the director of the EPA at that same time made a public statement that about 75 percent of the oil was already processed by natural events. The scientists that we were funding out there in the ocean knew that was not true. Mm. They started holding their own press conferences disagreeing with the government's position. And so in this federal response team that I'm on, I get questions like, uh, who are these people that you're funding that are disagreeing with the government's position? And my response was, um, these are people from universities. Uh, oh, and the question was also, can't you control what they say? <laughs> and my response was, these are people that come from universities where they have academic freedom and we give them grants, we don't give them contracts. So no, we don't control what they say. They have academic freedom and they pursue what they believe to be the truth. Uh, so to me, this illustrates a number of things. Um, most importantly, um, what the value of having researchers across the country funded through universities and by agencies like the National Science Foundation means to uh, uncovering the truth of, uh, of any particular episode that might happen. Uh, but also, the importance of tenure, the importance that people could actually speak up and disagree with the government and not worry about losing their jobs or having their grants canceled. Uh, and thirdly, it illustrates why scientists are a little bit reticent to get involved in a political process because if you actually were part of the political scene, uh, then your point of view might be viewed as being biased rather than an honest broker of what the truth really was. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is one of the best illustrations of why university research is so important to the nation. So you, you, you've raised this question of the intersection of research and the academy and politics. So last spring you co-authored an opinion piece in the Huffington Post about an effort in Congress to require the NSF, the National Science Foundation, to award grants only for research in the national interest. That's right. So um, what are the implications of such a, a, a policy? Why is that a problem from your perspective? Well, first of all, Think about how we would define what is in the national interest. Um, uh, there are numerous political overtones to how one might define that. Uh, the National Science Foundation is the principal agency that funds basic research for the nation. And it, there has been a major effort to keep that agency outside of the political landscape. The director of NSF, for instance, reports directly to the president. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a cabinet level position, but not through one of the cabinet officials either. And that's to keep it out of the political fray. Um, what the, uh, the legis well, it was really a budget legislation in which um, the chairman of the House Science Committee uh, wanted to have a budget that dictated the level of funding that went to each of the directorates inside NSF. That would mean that Congress would b basically be dictating how much geoscience should we fund, how much social science should we fund, how much physics. And the problem with that is there are members of Congress who, for instance, don't believe in climate change and don't want to see the government fund research in climate change. Well, that's in the geosciences directorate. So they can attack that type of science by reducing the budget for geoscience. And there are members of Congress that don't understand the social sciences and why the government should be funding studies of people. That would enable Congress to reduce those funding for those areas of science that they, don't, that they disagree with. And that would bring NSF into the middle of the political arena and would damage its reputation and its uh, uh, unbiased viewpoint um, immeasurably. You've, you've spoken eloquently about the importance of um, research that is unbiased and uninfluenced by politics and right. the impacts that it can have. Can you say something about the local impacts that the research at the University of Oregon has had in Eugene, Springfield, and Oregon overall? Right. Uh, let me, uh, actually, I brought a few statistics with me because I really want to answer that question in economic <laughs> terms. Okay, okay. Uh, of course, there are many ways that advancements in knowledge, um, creation of art, creation of music, um, understanding history, contribute to the quality of life. And, and so this is an incredibly enriched community because there are so many scholars in different disciplines. But then there's also the economic impact, which many times that's what universities are now asked to demonstrate. So let me just give you some statistics I brought with me from last year. Uh, spin outs from the University of Oregon last year, last calendar year, um, is re were responsible for 261 jobs in Oregon. 
Uh, the startups generated more than $38 million in revenue. Uh, and uh, th there are College of Education, which is particularly good at creating new technologies, uh, turned in, um, r r returned $7 million in licensing income uh, in that college alone. Uh, and th about 90% of those license, that income from licensing is reinvested back into the uh, academic organizations. Uh, rather than people walking off with it as individuals. Uh, so this is really um, indicative, I think, of the impact this university has economically. And as the Knight Campus comes along, that the outcomes online, that's going to expand dramatically. So you raised the uh, Knight Campus again. So I'm uh, the director of the Humanities Center. I'm a professor of the humanities. Um, is there a place uh, for humanities faculty and social science faculty to become involved in the, in the Knight Campus? I think there certainly will be. In fact, I think it would be very sad if that didn't happen uh, because the intersection between human culture and the natural and the natural sciences are where all the important questions lie in terms of the future of society. Take climate change as an example. Uh, we can have scientists that can, in fact, we are getting better and better at predicting exactly what will happen in the future. Uh, but how we respond to those challenges of a planet that we're responsible for changing, how will we change our own behavior? How will we inspire people to actually care about the future of the planet? Those are elements that come from the humanities. Uh, scientists can predict and inform, but inspiring people to care, is something that scientists aren't always good at doing. We have to work with people with other disciplines that connect directly to human culture and understand human culture. We have to understand ourselves. So there are many issues that are going to arise in the night camps, issues that deal with, for instance, um, genetic engineering and what are the ethical consequences of that. Um, uh, what are the impacts of new technology on the way we live? Uh, I know that people in our, um, our, uh, our um, architecture program, AAA, are very interested in how driverless cars will change urban living environments. So that intersection between technology and, and human society is extremely important. I think there will be numerous ways to, make, to connect those dots between the Knight Campus and the rest of the university. So before the Knight Campus gets online, um, you're, uh, you're already uh, taking some action in this regard. So yesterday you announced a new internal research award program to provide seed funding for interdisciplinary research in the environmental humanities and the social sciences. Tell us about that program and why you thought it was important to start it up. Well, we have tremendous strength in the environmental humanities. And in fact, uh, there is already an effort to organize a new academic emphasis on environmental humanities. But for all the reasons I just described, that's why I'm passionate about this area. We need to bring the humanities and the sciences together. We have a different program called the I3, which is incubating um, uh, interdisciplinary initiatives, I believe, is the triple I, I3. Uh, it's more science oriented. The new program we launched is sort of like a parallel companion program, mm -hmm. but it's more humanities oriented. Both of them, we actually hope, we we'll enjoy proposals. We love proposals that bring those together. And we hope that even on the humanities side, s some of the proposals we might see will include um, scientists, but it's going to be from a humanities perspective. And one of the goals of this program is to um, leverage uh, innovation to get further grants from external funding sources. Is that right? That's, That's what right. you mean by seed grant? That's right. So, you know, people ask, also often ask me, what, uh, who, people don't often know what a vice president for research does. Mm. My main responsibility, if you boil it down, is to make sure that we are bringing as much external funding to support scholarship on this campus as we possibly can. Uh, it's, that's, re that's important for two reasons. One being that there are many areas of scholarship you can't do without funding, and, there, and, th and some of those include the humanities. Um, but also, universities tend to rank themselves uh, based on how much external money they bring in. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, that's important. So when I launch new programs, I want to see them, I see them as an investment that will pay for itself because the seed funding we're providing should lead to new opportunities for external funds coming back to the university. 
So it'll be a re very wise financial investment as well as an investment in, uh, in our faculty. So you've started to give a sense of what the VPRI does. Yeah. What are some of the challenges that uh, confront people in that position? What are some of the challenges that you're confronting? Well, uh, one of the biggest is the fact that federal funding for research has been flat mm -hmm. and now faces an uncertain future uh, given the new administration. And I'm not a pessimist or an optimist. I generally try to stay in between being overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. The fact is we just don't know what the position of the incoming administration is with respect to investments in research and development writ large. So we're very, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, uh, but even before this administration, things had, have basically been flat. And while the costs of research keep going up, it essentially re represents a cut. So one, one of the things that um, it's most important for me to do is make sure we're well positioned to receive uh, as much federal funding and from other sources as well. But we can't just rely on the federal government anymore. We must also focus on philanthropy. So mm -hmm. a, the job of a VPR these days is as much about fundraising from um, private sources as it is from agencies. And that's why the Knight GIF is, we're actually, I think the University of Oregon is really now looked at as a model across the nation for attracting philanthropic support for research. And it's not just about the Knight GIF. It's the uh, gift for uh, $10 million gift we got for volcanology. Uh, another $10 million gift we got for the genomics and zebrafish colony. Uh, these are people that are giving to support basic research and facilities, and that's what every major research university would like to do more of. And so part of my challenge is to figure out how to do more of that, how to diversify the sources of, of support for research. So you've talked about um, the research that faculty and graduate students do, mostly what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about um, research programs for undergraduates at the University of Oregon. Yes, uh, we have a, a person in my office that's our undergraduate research uh, coordinator and he runs the um, Undergrad Research Opportunities Program, Europe. Uh, we have a number of mini grants, uh, small grants, uh, that go from between $1,000 and $5,000 on this campus that we administer through those programs. Some of them are, your uh, uh, Humanity Center operates one. Uh, we have one or, or two, a couple of that are from my office and then we have a presidential one. Uh, and they're all between $1,000 and $5,000. So there are funds that undergraduates can um, access to support summer research or academic year research. Why that's so important is because classroom education only takes you so far. Uh, experiential learning is is where the things you learn in the classroom really become understood. And it's also the excitement of discovery that keeps students interested in like, staying in the STEM disciplines. So that research opportunity actually has been piv pivotal to many people whose careers got started through an undergraduate research experience, including myself, including my daughter. Uh, so I view those undergraduate programs as extremely important to the creating the pipeline that, that creates the next generation of scientists and technologists. So let me just say, since you raised it, the, yeah. the humanities program is called the Humanities Undergraduate Research Program, uh, Research Fellowship, Fellowship Program. We call it HERF, yeah. and uh, it's a great program. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is, it is. <laughs> you just mentioned yeah. that um, in your own life, you had an undergraduate experience that inspired yes. you. You want to share that story? Sure. Uh, I uh, First of all, I went to a small college in Florida called Eckerd College, and I was uh, a biology major, but really interested in marine science. And one summer, I worked for a member of the faculty who had an NSF grant, and uh, it was a great experience. It was such a good experience that then I went on to do a senior thesis project, uh, which I was actually able to publish in a journal. So that really, that undergraduate experience really was the beginning of my career. And it does sometimes happen at the University of Oregon that undergrads who have worked in labs uh, are co-authors on published research. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yes, yes. That's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity for undergraduates to get involved in. So let's shift a little bit and talk a little bit about your own research. Sure. So what is your own research? What do you, what do you research? Yes, what do you I study the evolutionary ecology of fishes and apply that to fishery science. So what does that mean? Uh, most of my research has been on the East Coast and I've studied uh, several things, uh, but to try to say it in a few words, um, 
One of the big areas of my work has been on the, how fish evolve to climate change. And I use climates at different latitudes to understand that phenomenon. So for example, uh, there are many fish that live, that have distributions that go from Florida to Nova Scotia, vastly different climates. They have to have adaptations that are genetically based to be able to live in those environments. So a lot of my work has been on their, the physiology, life history, and behavioral accommodations, adaptations that fish display. One of them was that uh, northern fish um, do all of, do everything much faster than fish in the south. And they do that because they are squeezed into a very short growing season. And if they don't grow really fast in that first year, they don't make it through the next winter because they could, I gotta get big to survive. Uh, I was able to apply that finding to then look at what the impact of size selective mortality in fishing operations might have for fish. And I was the first person to demonstrate that um, size selective harvesting practice practices where, for example, you catch the largest, you keep the largest fish and then leave the small ones behind. That actually, from the fish's point of view, leads to the evolution of smaller sizes and lower rates of growth because if you grew fast, you'd just be caught sooner. And that's detrimental to yield. So when you think about our management practices from an evolutionary viewpoint, it turns what seems like common sense upside down because to continually catch large fish and leave small ones behind leads to the evolution of smaller size and lower yields. And why would people think the opposite? Why would they think that it's a good thing to, wh what's the logic that says, fish the big fish, leave the small ones? Oh, just the idea that uh, small fish, you should give them time to grow larger, that, that way you'll get a larger filet. Uh, <laughs> big fish are more fun to catch. Uh, it was sort of like, uh, well, a feel good thing. If I leave the small ones behind, I'm not taking everything, right? Mm -hmm. You know. Have, ha, has this research of yours impacted the management of fisheries? Has, well, it's it? actually created a huge controversy because there are, are many people uh, who still aren't certain that evolutionary consequences are something we have to worry about. Uh, but it has uh, led to rethinking of things like the minimum size limits that we use now. For example, if you actually had a slot limit where a, you, had a, you kept medium sized fish, mm -hmm you had a maximum and a minimum size, and only fish in the middle could you keep. Now, from the fish's point of view, the best strategy is to grow really fast to get through that window of vulnerability. So it turns it back around the other way. Uh, so there are people now that are, are, are exploring these sorts of uh, techniques. The other thing you can do is create marine reserves, marine, marine protected areas where you keep a segment of the population and the habitat that's critical uh, protected from fishing, and so, uh, the effects of fishing only affect a portion of the population, not every fish everywhere all the time. So you mentioned there are some people who don't uh, believe that we need to worry about evolutionary impact. What's that logic? Help me to understand that. How, how does that uh, There's still a, a view that ecological impacts of fishing um, are much more prevalent and that uh, uh, they are what we should be focusing our attention on. But your, it sounds like your work has actually sh sort of shown that that's a false distinction. We need to account for both ecological and evolutionary consequences. Um, but uh, whenever somebody introduces a new idea, um, there's always um, a, a controversy, um, a, an opposing point of view. People don't let go of their long-held beliefs very easily. Uh, I think um, those ideas are becoming assimilated uh, but at the time I did the work, if you picked up a textbook on fisheries management and looked for anything that related to evolutionary consequences of fishing, you wouldn't have, find a, you wouldn't have found a single page. And I mean, I think people might feel intuitively, wait, wait, evolution is the result of random variations in genes. How could how f we fish impact that? And, you, and you're, you've actually shown that it can, in, those impacts happen quickly. Yes, so uh, this is just one of uh, many areas of managing natural resources where we used to think that evolutionary change took thousands of generations. Now we know it, it, it in many cases, only takes a few generations to be felt. Um, so, um, now what was the other part of your question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's, let me ask you a different question. Yeah. So you've, you've been here since August. Right. And you've talked about um, the promise and what appealed to you and the exciting things that are happening. Yeah. 
What was the most surprising thing uh, that you learned when you came to the University of Oregon? What was the thing that you didn't expect to find that you discovered? I'm going to mention two things. Okay, please do. And, and one of them has become a huge issue, which is uh, I had no idea that the lack of diversity was so prevalent on this campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in the state of Oregon. Uh, you know, during the interview process, somehow I didn't assimilate, I didn't observe well enough that, you know, this is not a very diverse campus. I came from Stony Brook University, which is a very diverse campus. A lot of international students, but people from many different minority groups, and that's the way the New York City area is. You know, we're kind of in a rural, even though Eugene is a city, it's mostly a rural environment we're in, uh, and there's just not much diversity here. And so when issues of diversity arise, they, they uh, actually become um, much more accentuated than they, I think they would of other institutions. So that's been a surprise. Uh, the other thing that's a surprise is uh, I always viewed Oregon as a very progressive state uh, that would be uh, well in tune with the value of education. But I was shocked to find after I moved here that this is a state with one of the lowest high school graduation rates in the nation. And uh, it's also a state that doesn't appreciate the value of higher education as much as other states do. I sort of knew that, but I didn't know that this even uh, reached into the K through 12 level. Uh, and for a state that views itself as being progressive, that's a stunning contradiction that we need to do something about. So say some of the things that uh, you and the other administrators of the university are trying to do about that. Well, one of my, one of, one of the things I think is most important and I think I should be leading in this role is to do a better job of communicating the values that higher education bring to the state. And my piece of that is the v importance of research done at universities that, that we've been talking about for the last um, several minutes. Uh, I would like to see us do a better job of communicating um, the discoveries we make and making the connection to how that improves the lives of people. And the Knight Campus is gonna help us with that. But I was at Stony Brook involved with helping to found the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science. And this center gives training to faculty to be able to tell an engaging story about the scholarship they do in terms that can connect with common people. Uh, and that's something I really hope we do a better job. And I'm gonna be leading uh, that as we move forward. Well, on that note, since that's the kind of work we've been doing for the past half hour. Here we are, do here we are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, David, for taking the time to talk to us today about your work as the new VPRI at the University of Oregon. Thank you. I've enjoyed our conversation. I've been speaking with David Conover, Vice President for Research and Innovation and Professor of Biology at the University of Oregon. He began his tenure at the U of O on August 15th, 2016. Thank you so much for watching.